Good morning. I'm Dr. Andrew LaBarbera, Chief Scientific Officer of the American Society for Reproductive Medicine. Welcome to the 12th presentation of the ASRM Grand Rounds webinar series. These twice-monthly webinars are designed to address topics in the IBOG Guide to Learning in Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility. Today's presentation will be given by Dr. Robert Rebar, who is currently Professor of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the Western Michigan University Homer Stryker MD School of Medicine in Kalamazoo, Michigan. The title of his talk today is Abnormal Uterine Bleeding. I will now turn the microphone over to Dr. Jeffrey Hayes, our education specialist, who will review the details of today's presentation and introduce Dr. Rebar. Thank you so much. Hello to everyone. I'm Jeffrey Hayes, the ASRM education specialist and moderator for this webinar. Before beginning the webinar, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. First, to make sure we can cover all the content in the allotted time, everyone's line except the speakers will be muted. We will devote time at the end of the presentation to questions. Please feel free to type a question in the chat window at any time. We will then read as many selected questions as possible to the presenter. If for some reason you need to step away from the presentation, please sign out and then sign back in upon your return. After the webinar is done, please do not forget to return to ASRM eLearn to take the post-test and complete the survey for your CME credit. You must complete the post-test question successfully and complete the survey to receive credit and be able to print off your certificate. Our speaker today is Dr. Robert Rebar. We're very excited to have him. I will now turn things over to Dr. Rebar. Greetings from actually Hickory Corners, Michigan. I want to begin by thanking the ASRM for asking me to give this presentation. And uh, I also will tell you that in spite of my title, I really am uh, mostly retired. And I'm sitting here in my study looking out on our lake where there are several ice fishermen today since the temperature is a mild 28 degrees. Let me begin by, if I could, just talking with you about um, my disclosures for this presentation. As the deputy editor of uh, contraception, and an associate editor of Journal Watch Women's Health and OBGYN Alert, uh, I do wish you to know that I frequently read articles on this subject. However, uh, this is not what, uh, of any uh, consequence for this presentation. Perhaps more importantly, I'm the past executive director of ASRM, but I want to emphasize that the views expressed in this presentation do not necessarily reflect those of ASRM but really represent mine and mine alone, if you will. At the conclusion of this presentation, I would hope that you would be able to define abnormal uterine bleeding, discuss the major causes of what I'm going to call AUB, and be familiar with the International Federation of Gynecology and Obstetrics FIGO classification system, outline an approach to evaluation of various patients with AUB, and at least uh, discuss management of the major causes of AUB. To begin with, let's define abnormal uterine bleeding. And I would define it as uterine bleeding occurring at an unexpected time or of abnormal duration. And it can take many forms. It can take the form of intermenstrual bleeding or of heavy menstrual bleeding itself. It can clearly occur postmenopausally. There are many other terms that have been used that are shown on this slide that really should be relegated to history and history alone. And these include the terms menorrhagia or hypermenorrhea, metrorrhagia, menometrorrhagia, polymenorrhea, and oligomenorrhea because they have different meanings to different groups and in different parts of the world. Now, in discussing abnormal uterine bleeding, it's important to put this in the context of the normal menstrual cycle. And to do so, we really can best turn to data from the Treman Trust, which was originated by Dr. Trelloar, who collected menstrual cycle length data from thousands of women over many years. And when he reported these data, what he noted, and what all of you know, is that menstrual cycle length length 
is most constant during the mid-reproductive years and varies most in the early reproductive years, that is, during adolescence, and also during the years immediately preceding the menopause, during the menopausal transition. And I think that's well demonstrated on this slide showing the 95% confidence interval for menstrual cycle length. This, of course, makes it difficult to talk about what a normal cycle length is, and we typically think of a normal menstrual cycle as lasting from 24 to 35 days. We also consider that the duration of flow in any menstrual period is typically from four to six days, and when studies have been done, the suggestion is that the average amount of blood loss is about 30 milliliters. Abnormality exists when greater than 80 milliliters of blood is lost, or if a period is less than two days in length or greater than seven days in length. Now, it's important to recognize that there are differences with regard to race in the United States into who is likely to seek aid or treatment. It turns out that in our country, Hispanic women are less likely to seek aid or treatment and African-American women who are disproportionately affected by both fibroids and anemia are more likely to seek prompt medical care. So ethnic and cultural differences clearly play into what we see in our offices. It's also important to recognize that abnormal uterine bleeding is the most common indication for gynecologic consultation. It's been estimated that it affects more than 10 million women in the United States, or that is approximately 20% of women of reproductive age. And although we can argue about when and where DNC should been, be done, it's been uh, stated that it accounts for 80 to 90% of DNCs that are now performed in non-pregnant women in the United States, and that amounts to about 350,000 procedures per year. Abnormal uterine bleeding remains the second most common indication for hysterectomy in the U.S. after uterine fibroids, and it accounts for about 20% or 130,000 hysterectomies annually. Now, there are some general concepts that I always think about when I think about abnormal uterine bleeding. Putting things in generalities clearly can lead to errors, but in general, too frequent bleeding generally means there's an organic cause, a structural cause, and infrequent bleeding is generally due to anovulation. So that's kind of a, a general rule of thumb. A person bleeding more often than one would expect, think organic. A person bleeding less often, think anovulation. In taking a history, it's clearly important to document three things, the frequency, the duration, and the amount. But, and because of this, there is no substitute for a menstrual calendar. Women often tell you when they present with abnormal bleeding that they're bleeding too frequently. But, on the other hand, they may tell you uh, the pattern is really unclear to them or the details they give you may be incorrect. If you're uncertain of the pattern, give them a calendar or to, on which to record the days on which they bleed. That is most important. If you think about it the way I did with regard to organic causes and ovulation, and, and ovulation, then you can think that there are two major categories, organic causes and anovulation. Under organic causes, there are really two major causes as well. Systemic diseases, which include coagulation disorders, thyroid dysfunction, and liver disease primarily, and reproductive tract disease. Now, anovulation in much of the old literature, in fact, much of very recent literature as well, is typically termed dysfunctional uterine bleeding. I think this is a poor term, and internationally, it's been discouraged that this term should no longer be used. So let's try to get away from using that term, dysfunctional uterine bleeding. But organic causes and anovulation. Now, 
not too many years ago, an international group was uh, held, um, was, was brought together, and uh, underwent a Delphi process to try to get at the causes and, and the characteristics of abnormal uterine bleeding in more detail. I happened to attend that particular meeting and be one of the participants. At that meeting, uh, the group came up with the various causes and developed what was called the Palm-Cohen system. This system has since been adopted by SIGO. I will tell you that I actually had some difficulties, even though I participated in this Delphi process, because I find it a little bit complicated. But if you take a look, Palm stands for polyps, adenomyosis, leiomyomas, malignancy, and hyperplasia, structural abnormalities, if you will. And Cohen stands for coagulopathy, ovulatory disorders, endometrium, iatrogenic, and not classified. Remember, this Palm-Cohen system has been adopted by uh, Figo. Now, in the article that was published following the gathering of this group, uh, there was a table, and I show it on this slide, indicating that abnormal bleeding includes heavy menstrual bleeding and intermenstrual bleeding, and that it really can be divided into two causes, structural and non-structural. I still prefer the approach of organic and anovulation, uh, but I certainly would wish you to be familiar uh, with the FIGO approach. Now, at the Delphi process, it was pointed out that one could actually use the Palm-Cohen system to actually designate what the actual abnormality is. And that's what's shown on this figure. Again, this was reported in Fertility and Sterility and came from that group of international experts on the disorder that came together. I find this to be a very complicated approach to recording abnormal uterine bleeding, but clearly many people find it useful, and I show you some examples on this particular slide. In addition, it was pointed out that one could also use this same system to classify leiomyomas, and the classification system that was developed is shown here on this slide. I, too, find this very complicated uh, and find it much more descriptive to actually write what you find and what you see. But again, uh, this is a system that is now being used, and I call it to your attention. Again, classification systems are ways of communicating with one another, and if they assist us in that uh, activity, then they do have significant usefulness. Okay, let's go on now and talk about some of the major causes of abnormal uterine, and I'll include here genital bleeding, uh, that occur throughout life. And let's begin with the prepubertal years. I think all of you know that newborn girls sometimes spot for a few days after birth uh, because of placental estrogenic stimulation uh, of the endometrium uh, of the newborn child that occurred in utero. In prepubertal children, one also needs to think about accidental trauma to the vulva or vagina. This is the most common cause of genital bleeding. And vaginitis with spotting most often occurs uh, because of irritation from a foreign body. Children look for cavities, and there may often be foreign bodies in the vagina or that have been applied uh, to the vulva. Prolapse of the urethral meatus and tumors of the genital tract always must be considered, though they are not all that common. But what is common is sexual abuse. And again, anytime you see abnormal bleeding during the prepubertal years, one needs to think about sexual abuse. And of course, if sexual abuse is identified, then state reporting is required in virtually every state. When bleeding is due to ingestion of estrogen-containing drugs by children, uh, there is rarely significant pubertal development. Now, I've seen this when a child has gotten hold of a mother's package of birth control pills and taken the whole package, for example. And that's about the only time uh, that I have seen the ingestion of estrogen-containing products. 
this often happens outside the United States where many of these are now much more easily obtainable and estrogens are in many products uh, that are sold over the counter as well. In adolescence, one always needs to think about primary coagulation disorders. And on this slide, I show you a graph that appeared in an old article from the 1960s from the Toronto Hospital for Children. At that time, they noted that almost 20% of adolescents who presented with bleeding disorders had, in fact, coagulation disorders. Of note also, about three quarters, 75%, had abnormal uterine bleeding that was due to anovulation. And remember again that anovulation is common in, in the early uh, pubertal years, shortly after menarche. Let me remind you once more, in the older literature, and I'd like to think that this use is now ending, dysfunctional uterine bleeding typically means anovulatory bleeding. Now, although anovulation is a common cause of abnormal bleeding in adolescence, in fact, the most common cause, its actual incidence is really low, and most of these cases spontaneously resolve as shown by the data that I showed you from the Treman Trust. However, you always need to think about pregnancy-related problems, even in teens, and again, you always must remember that coagulation disorders account for a high percentage, about 20%, of abnormal bleeding in teenagers. I want to review with you some criteria for polycystic ovarian syndrome in adolescents. Why do I do so? In part, because of the high incidence of irregular menses shortly after menarche, it's important to distinguish what is normal from what is abnormal. And the ASRM and ESHRI have had three different conferences at which uh, they have attempted to address polycystic ovarian syndrome. In one of those conferences, which I attended, we came to the conclusion that the Rotterdam criteria used in adults should be met for at least two years and maybe longer before one gave a diagnosis to polycystic ovarian syndrome to an adolescent, and that all three must be present, hyperandrogenism, clinical and or biochemical, oligo and or anovulation, and polycystic ovaries on ultrasound. So don't be too quick to make the diagnosis of PCOS in adolescents. Clearly, because of childhood obesity, its incidence is increasing, but still, many individuals who present with irregular bleeding in, in adolescence may be normal and may revert to normal over the next one to two years. Now, what about abnormal bleeding during any of the reproductive years? And here, too, I'm talking about adolescence. You're thinking to yourself two things. What's the underlying cause, and is the patient ovulatory? Is it an organic cause, or is it an ovulation? Again. So once more, coming to the Rotterdam Consensus Conference for Polycystic Ovarian Syndrome, anovulation, the most common cause uh, of which is PCOS in adulthood, two of three, hyperandrogenism, oligo and or anovulation, polycystic ovaries, exclusion of other etiology. Those are what we need to focus on if we're going to make this diagnosis. Now, we can argue about the age, but any older woman, and one could say greater than 35, one could say greater than 40, uh, with abnormal bleeding must be evaluated for a malignancy. And endometrial hyperplasia after menopause, because here now I'm adding in the postmenopausal years, should lead to a search for a source of estrogen. And clearly, endometrial hyperplasia after the menopause indicates that there must be a source of estrogen. OK, with that background of evaluating younger women, prepubertal girls, and older women, let's talk about the actual process of evaluation. I've already alluded to you that a perspective calendar is most important. It's one of the things that I always send people out of the office with 
It's also important on the physical examination to assess hemodynamic stability. And clearly, laboratory tests include hematocrit and hemoglobin, an HCG to rule out pregnancy, a coagulation profile, TSH, since abnormalities of the thyroid are typically associated with irregular bleeding, uh, and hysteroscopy and or tissue sampling as appropriate. I showed you actually this same information, if you will, in a publication from ACOG's GYN Practice Committee. It goes into a bit more detail, but I think you will see that, that the effective data obtained are effectively the same as what I discussed in the preceding slide with you. Now, at the time that the expert group met for the Delphi process, they also considered how to proceed with the investigation of abnormal uterine bleeding. And clearly, the most important thing, first and foremost, is to determine if there is chronic abnormal uterine bleeding, or if there is an acute episode that demands immediate treatment, or if a watchful approach is indicated. Now, at that time, that group concluded that chronic abnormal uterine bleeding meant that there was three or more months of excessive duration, volume, frequency, and unpredictability. And if there was, then again, a history and a physical examination were indicated to begin with, with ancillary investigations as indicated. Now, at the publication that emanated uh, from that consensus conference, if you will, they also published uh, a flow diagram for looking at uterine evaluation. Every time I look at this graph, I can't believe that we arrived at it because to me, it looks a bit complicated. And I think that we have simplified it in a previous uh, learning module that's contained on the ASRM website and which I show you on the next slide. And that is to evaluate uh, the environment one determines whether or not there's a risk of a structural abnormality or a risk of hyperplasia or neoplasia. For a structural abnormality, consider transvaginal ultrasound. If there's an abnormal cavity, then one can proceed with saline infusion sonography or hysteroscopy and biopsy. Uh, and one need not go to routine MRI, as shown in the top portion of this slide. If there's a risk of hyperplasia or neoplasia, then an office endometrial biopsy uh, can be obtained. If inadequate, then hysteroscopy is certainly warranted. Clearly, if the woman is over 45, endometrial biopsy is justified. But if the woman is under 45 with unopposed estrogen for a period of time, and typically it takes three years or more to get to endometrial hyperplasia, then if there's failed medical treatment or persistent abnormal uterine bleeding, it's time really to determine what's going on. I think this is much simpler than that uh, flow diagram that appeared in the previous article. With regard to managing abnormal uterine bleeding, the principles are really simple. Rule out a uterine abnormality. Hormonal therapy can almost always stop an ovulatory bleeding, but it's important to remember that the bleeding will occur, it will recur at a later, hopefully controlled time. So when a woman comes in who would benefit from hormonal therapy, what I've always said to them is this, I know that these hormones that I'm going to give you will stop your bleeding almost always, but Here's when you're going to bleed into the future. And based on the regimen I've selected, I point out to them when they can expect to bleed again. With regard to anovulatory bleeding, the management depends on the severity of the problem, depends on the age of the patient, and it depends on her desires regarding future fertility. So, if pregnancy is desired in an anovulatory woman, for example, with heavy irregular menses or irregular bleeding, since these may not be ovulatory, induce ovulation. If not, in general, add a progestin. Because 
secretion of estrogen may be sporadic and fluctuating, adding an estrogen is generally warranted as well. So intensive therapy with estrogen and progestin is the treatment of choice. And I think you all know that today we have tranexamic acid uh, available as an option as well. With regard to DNCs, DNCs can be used to stop acute bleeding in patients with hypovolemia. But quite frankly, I found that medical therapy is often just as effective and takes merely a matter of hours to stop the bleeding. And remember that a DNC only treats the acute episode of excess bleeding and not subsequent episodes. And clearly, a DNC may not treat the cause of the bleeding. So a DNC is generally of little value unless acute hormone therapy is not successful in stopping bleeding. Now with regard to long-term treatment, all kinds of agents have been used to treat anovulatory bleeding. Most common, oral contraceptive agents or cyclic estrogen and progestin. Progestins alone have been used. Again, I find these less effective unless one adds a constant amount of estrogen simultaneously. I will tell you that if one looks at the Cochrane report, uh, one is not able to demonstrate in good studies, controlled trials, uh, that there are differences among these first three. GnRH analogs have been used. Danazole has been used. A progestin containing IUD can be a good alternative uh, depending on the presentation. And for ovulation induction, clomiphene citrate, or more recently, uh, letrozole uh, can be used as well. I would suggest to you that surgical treatment is generally indicated only when medical treatment fails. And today, we have many approaches that are possible besides hysterectomy. Myomectomy for submucous fibroids. Uh, and that's really only warranted for submucous fibroids. There's really no good data that other kinds of fibroids contribute to abnormal uterine bleeding. Uterine artery embolization has been used increasingly. MR-guided focused ultrasound ablation is being used infrequently. And I think any of you, many of you know uh, that endometrial ablation by any of several methods uh, is also being used increasingly. It's important to note uh, that the literature really shows that it may not result in the cure or it may not be permanent, and many of these individuals come back for a second procedure, but it can provide immediate, short-term, intermediate uh, relief for many. And of course, uh, the ultimate treatment uh, is hysterectomy. After menopause, it's important to evaluate any postmenopausal bleeding occurring uh, in women who are not on estrogen. And it's important to distinguish vaginal, cervical, or rectal bleeding from uterine bleeding. Certainly, the most common cause is endometrial bleeding, but it's important to note uh, that a thin vagina uh, can have bleeding, uh, lead to bleeding as well. Either endometrial sampling or ultrasound evaluation may be appropriate depending on the circumstances uh, and the findings. Now, I wanted to, to conclude by really taking a look at endometrial hyperplasia. And the literature here is really quite old, remarkably old. But if one takes a look, endometrial hyperplasia that has no atypia regresses merely with exogenous progestin therapy. Now, it's been documented in the literature that repeat endometrial sampling is warranted after therapy to document cure. And this literature really comes uh, beginning in the 60s uh, because of a desire to avoid hysterectomy in, in women who were not good candidates for surgery. With atypia, it turns out that many regress with progestin therapy, but repeat sampling is certainly needed at frequent intervals in order to make sure that regression has occurred, and hysterectomy is warranted if hyperplasia persists. I wanted to turn to some of the very first studies that were published 
and just show you what was reported in 1986 and noted that of 70 patients that were studied by GAL and given magestral acetate, rarely used today, but still sometimes used, uh, that 93% regressed and persistence occurred only in 7%. And there was no progression to carcinoma uh, for uh, this group of individuals treated with high dose, and it was 40 milligrams per day of magestral acetate, if you will. And there really were no major side effects. Interestingly, if one took a look at um, um, those without atypia versus with atypia in another study from Canada, 80% of those actually had without atypia and regressed, and none progressed to carcinoma. And with atypia, only about 25% progressed to carcinoma. So it's important to remember that endometrial hyperplasia uh, induced by unopposed estrogen often can be treated medically for those individuals who are not good candidates uh, for surgery. Well, let me end this discussion, uh, and it's a difficult discussion to have in a short time on abnormal uterine bleeding, by just noting that this is really a common problem in women of all ages. I, I would tell you that I have not tried to go in in detail uh, on many features here because we could have this discussion all day long. I would say that treatment of an ovulatory bleeding almost always should begin with medical therapy. And today, structural uterine abnormalities can be treated by methods other than hysterectomy. And I didn't even discuss polypectomy, for example, for uterine polyps. But many women, several, uh, a reasonable percentage undergoing such treatment ultimately do end up, for one reason or another, undergoing hysterectomy. At this point in time, uh, I would be happy to answer any questions uh, that those of you listening might have. Thank you thank so you. much, Dr. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rebar. Uh, if, if you have a question for Dr. Rebar, uh, please type your question into the chat window, uh, and we'll be happy to uh, ask. And we already have a, a question for him. Uh, Dr. Rebar, the question is, why didn't you discuss the various methods of endometrial ablation in the treatment of abnormal uterine bleeding? I, I chose not to do so because of the fact that there are a whole host of a, reviews on the subject, and I really thought uh, that it would take so much time that I wouldn't be able to stay within the time frame allotted uh, for this presentation. Uh, I also thought that it was more important uh, to take a look at an overview of this field and, and then really send you uh, to other sources uh, to consider the various methods uh, of endometrial ablation. Thank you. Well, it appears, Dr. Rebar, that we have no more questions uh, at this time, so I'll go ahead and move on to our closing statements. Uh, thank you all for attending today's webinar with Dr. Oh, one moment. I'm sorry. We, we, uh, we have a question. Um, how is the accuracy of endometrial biopsy compared to fractional curatage? Um, there have not been good studies in this regard. It is very clear that hysteroscopy and selective biopsy is no doubt superior to random endometrial biopsy. Random endometrial biopsy can clearly miss lesions, but there have been no good studies as to how often this happens. And, and that's because more and more individuals have turned to hysteroscopy with selective biopsy uh, to uh, address the abnormal bleeding, particularly when an abnormality has been identified in the endometrial cavity uh, on um, ultrasound. Thank you, Dr. Rebar. Uh, another question, uh, what is the official or legal cutoff age for endometrial biopsy in a patient without risk factors? Uh, I'm not sure if we're talking about the uh, under age or over age here, but let me try to address that. There is no official uh, cutoff, if you will, 
uh, I would tell you again that almost invariably one needs three years of unopposed estrogen uh, to see endometrial hyperplasia. So if one sees a year of abnormal bleeding, most of us, in fact, uh, I would do the same, uh, obtain a biopsy, but I, I, I really would be surprised to see any alarming um, um, hyperplasia present uh, on that uh, uh, biopsy. So there's no lower age, and I think as long as an individual has abnormal bleeding, uh, an endometrial biopsy can be obtained even in the postmenopausal years. It may be more difficult to obtain a biopsy in the postmenopausal years uh, because of cervical stenosis, but this clearly varies from individual to individual. Thank you, Dr. Rebar. We'll give everyone just one more moment. If anyone has any other questions, just go ahead and please type them into the chat window for us. Well, Dr. Rebar, it, it appears there are no more questions at this time, uh, so we'll go ahead and move on to uh, closing uh, comments. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar with Dr. Robert Rebar. Uh, please do not forget to return to ASRM eLearn to take the post-test and complete the survey. Our next live event will be on Thursday, March the 3rd at 6 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time with Dr. Stacy Pollack, who will present on the topic of amenorrhea. Please look for an email from ASRM with registration details soon. Thank you again to our speaker today. Thank you to all in attendance.